Shall we get started? Microphone? Yeah, now it works. Perfect. Hello, my name is Ulrike Rohn. I'm a professor of media economics and media management here at Tallinn University. And I, it's my great honor to chair today's keynote by Professor Joseph Straubha from the University of Texas at Austin. Jo Professor Straubha has significantly contributed to the understanding of global media flows, and he has intensively published on this topic. Actually, in fact, one of, his, one of my favorite academic books is published by him, and it's titled World Television from Global to Local. I personally feel very happy that Joe came here to Estonia and to speak with us here at ICCPR, because I, I actually came across, of his, across his work very early on in my academic career or academic life. Um, his notion of cultural proximity that he developed through the studies in Brazil and that he will also, I think, refer to or mention today in his speak, um, inspired me already on my MA thesis and also in a PhD thesis. So I can honestly say that his work has inspired me and as it has done so many others. Yesterday, José van Dijk spoke about the platform society that we live in. And today, Joseph Straubha will speak about one of these platforms, the platform of Netflix, and how it influences global flow of cultural content. So, without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you for coming, Joe. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. In fact, I want to return the compliment to Ulrike. She's one of the people in the world, literally, that I probably had the most interesting dialogue with over some of these issues over the years. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. And in fact, it's interesting. A lot of my early work kind of dealt with one of the themes of the conference, which in many ways Netflix challenges. So I'm, I'm finding, kind of finding the idea of talking about Netflix directly challenging and directly interesting, because I've been working very much on the idea of how Cultural flows are, in fact, regulated to some degree by cultural, by cultural attraction and by cultural boundaries. But in many ways, one of the interesting things about Netflix, as the title here says, is we sort of have a new logic. Are we going from a, a fairly effective regulation of global flows by boundaries of culture and language, where speak, for instance, speaking English with our, with, for, if you're Canadian speaking English, spe the, there's actually a kind of an almost negative cultural boundary with the United States. On the other hand, if you're Mexico just south, or even the Latinos within the US borders, there's an interesting boundary there of language and culture, which to some degree protects your culture from the US outflow. What I'm finding about Netflix though, and one, one reason I'm kind of about, six-eighths of the way through a, a book project on this, so keep, stay tuned, as, it, as the word, phrase goes. Um, I'm kind of interested in how Netflix challenges the current arrangements of television. And my, my, the key to, I think, the argument is, is kind of in the title. I think in some ways, Netflix is cutting across at a kind of transverse angle, the traditional lines of flow. That we've had a huge US output, which Netflix, uh, let's see, where's our clicker? Oh, Don't worry, I walked off without it, my problem. <laughs> in some ways, uh, you know, Netflix, in some ways for some people, particularly in political economy, I think seems very familiar. Oh no, a new wave of cultural imperialism, new, uh, particularly more specifically of media imperialism, and it probably is. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna necessarily contest that in a particular way, but I think it's one layer of at least three, four, possibly five angles of flow right now. And so there is in fact this renewed sending out of American TV. And I think part of Netflix's success was catching a ride on this new golden age of American TV, which has given it a lot of stuff to very profitably export. And so that's definitely part of the picture. But you know, if you've been following TV, global TV studies, you've known that my work on Brazil, lots of other people's work on other cultures, has shown that a lot of protection for national 
national television. Uh, my wife is a Scandinavianist, and so we spent half a year in Denmark 10 years ago, and I was interested in something she had told me much earlier, was that in many ways the Danes were worried about whether use of their language and particularly the protection of their language through television and mechanisms like television would at some point be eroded. And what I found in Denmark was quite fascinating. They wanted to watch Danish TV a lot. In fact, they were producing, I would say, about all the TV they could possibly afford to produce for a, a, a market that size. But on the other hand, they were intimately familiar with American TV. In fact, they actually preferred the original Ricky Lake show to a Danish version of the Ricky Lake show, which I found kind of culturally incomprehensible since I sort of hated Ricky Lake in the first place. But, um, but still, I mean, they actually found the original in English more authentic. A couple of Danish colleagues did some really interesting work on that. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting use of authenticity. If authenticity isn't bounded by language, in fact, I think in some ways it's a predecessor of what we're now finding, which I think Netflix does represent as a, as a whole new transnational layer of flow. Not exactly, it fits, if you imagine global, to be a very diverse paradigm with lots of layers of, of, of like in the Pottery sense, of lots of layers of interaction. But not necessarily a particularly one-way American thing only. And I think it sort of it, it challenges some of our notions. So let's, let's interrogate it a bit. So at the level of cultural imperialism, I'm not going to linger on the slides. I'll be happy to send them to you if you want. I mean, we, we went through literal moral and political panics about the American outflow of film, news, and TV in the 1970s, leading up to the New World Information and Communication Order debate, um, which is still worth, if, you, if you're young enough that you didn't go through that at all or haven't read about it, Going back to that as a sort of benchmark is really intellectually quite worthwhile. That there was a huge fear of the acceptance of cultural capitalism which, and consumer capitalism, which in fact, I think, has largely taken place. So Herb Schiller was quite right about that. The desire to become middle class. Again, probably Herb was quite right about that. The question of Americanization and cultural homogenization, perhaps not so clearly. So it'd be, it's interesting to think about how we think about flows now. And I remember one of the first books I actually read all the way through in Spanish was Como leer el pato Donald, you know, how to read Donald Duck. And uh, it was a definite fear of precisely these US ideologies of being middle class and, and participating in consumer capitalism. So this had its impact. Now the interesting question is, does Netflix represent an escalation? And it may well. I mean, I, I do a lot of work, particularly on Brazil, Latin America more generally. And so I'm going to present a lot of data today about Latin America and to some degree specifically about Brazil to kind of stand in for what I think are global trends. Because I have access to much more to the Latin American information and data than I do the whole world. So in Brazil, the American stuff is quite popular. In fact, I teach graduate seminars in a couple of universities in Brazil once, once or twice, once every year or two. And they were one-upping each other, you know, inside and outside of class with what they'd seen. So if you want to invoke symbolic capital from Bourdieu, they were de this, their, their understanding, liking, and kind of public display of Netflix was very notable. It's in this listening to those same students talk, they weren't quite as tuned into the European, Asian, or other possibilities, but they were also very interested in what was going to start happening with Netflix producing in Brazil and producing in Latin America. So I think a couple of things. I think, again, there's this very strong regional flow of television within Europe, within Latin America, within Asia, perhaps within the Middle East. In fact, the Middle East, if you've not studied it, is probably the place where regional TV has truly surpassed national TV to some degree. So this goes from, say, Europe, where the intra-regional flow is probably less than it should be, to Asia, where it's very strong, to Latin America, where it's quite strong, to the Middle East, where it's very strong. And so it's interesting to see how Netflix works in that milieu. So they're actually borrowing stars from television and film like Kate Del Castillo. Like we had a bit of incomprehension in the US when American newspapers were mystified that a gangster named El Chapo was very anxious to see Kate Del Castillo and only middling interest in seeing Sean Penn. 
when they came together. And I thought, they don't know much about Mexico. <laughs> and they particularly don't know much about Mexican TV, because she's a superstar. And she's now become a regional and Iberian superstar. And, so she, and she's now starred in several things for Netflix. And so they are borrowing her to, to create a star system, just like the same way they've borrowed Jose, G, Jose Pagilla, Pagilia to um, a Brazilian, very prominent Brazilian director to now do, first do Narcos and now do a very nitty gritty drama in Brazil about Brazilian political corruption. And so they're doing pretty well at regional and national. So let's pick up a bit of theory as, as, uh, as you heard mentioned just a minute ago. Um, my argument for cultural proximity was that people, starting with humor and with the boundaries of language itself, were going to prefer the things that were closer and more relevant to them, more, more pro proximate. And I thought it would work not only nationally, but also regionally. Now, it turns out that regional extension of that idea is a little problematic. We'll, we'll sort of come back to that. But in the, starting in the 70s, we saw a lot of TV flow, particularly of the primetime dramas called telenovelas. There's a famous one from Brazil from 1985. But Brazil started exporting them first to Latin America and then to the Lusophone world already in the 70s. And so there was certainly a logic of flow within geographical and cultural linguistic boundaries. And now I think very, very specifically a new logic that Netflix is going into if we want We'd like to do something that has national success, a strong national connection, but also the potential for export. How many of actually, have, how many of you have watched 3%? Oh, only a few. And if, if you can imagine a science fiction dystopia crossed with high level soap opera, that's kind of what you get. It's pretty good actually. And it's interesting how they got to it. Uh, the Brazilian government has a very kind of a, they've stumbled through three or four decades of how do we f subsidize film and TV in a profitable way. And they finally hit on a pretty good formula. Uh, su subsidizing pilots for which they have to have a tentative dis uh, distribution agreement. And this, and the first was a, 3% three, three was first a web series and then Netflix picked it up from that. And so it's interesting to think how they'll begin to do, do more of that. And it will have national impact. I mean, I think Brazilian television, the Brazilian TV system is quite strong. That Netflix has essentially conquered the internal market to some degree amongst at least the middle class to the point where they, they now have a better audience and better revenue than the number three TV station. So that's a thing to think about. So if you think about, and it's hard, I'm not sure this is at all visible. <laughs> I suddenly realized it's a terrible slide. At any rate, the, if you're interested in looking at people doing innovative audience research, Parrot Analytics is kind of an interesting place to look. And they'll send you lots of stuff for free if you sign up. So if you look at who most liked a Spanish caper series called Money Heist or La Casa de Papel, um, first Brazil, then France, then Spain, interestingly enough, Argentina, Turkey, United States, Italy, Mexico, Chile, Portugal, etc. So I, I picked that one particularly because there's both a regional appeal within the contours of Mediterranean and Iberian culture, but also the United States, Turkey, et cetera. So I think in some ways this gives you a sense of where Netflix kind of sees its own internal regulation of culture and language, that it's gonna use them, but also cross them. And so there's a couple of logics there that they're not entirely ignoring the, the cultural logic or regulation, if you will, by language and culture, they're gonna use it, but they're feeling, but they would like to appeal across it. So how they go transnational, I think in some ways this is the in most interesting part. Because yes, they're global in the very traditional 70 cents of lots of American stuff into the world, but and yes, they're trying to do local and national and regional, but I think their new forte with a whole different governing logic is following both genre and then aggregated audience data, you, working through both psychographics and a lot of genre data about individual genre preferences into these, in through very carefully done algorithmic patterns. So I think this in some ways is the new kind of governing logic which may come to challenge. And very much if you, if you went to Jose's, um, con talk yesterday, 
you know, hopefully most of you did, because that I think lays out the technology behind a lot of this. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk too much deeply about the mechanisms of it, but I think what, what Netflix is doing, in fact, I'll come back to this. They're, they're both very carefully detailing profiles by genre and profiles by, by individual, which is a bit, little bit different than, say, the logic of an Amazon. So if you think about the flows, and I'm, I'm, I wish I were better at drawing arrows on graphs, honestly. I've somehow missed that part of my education. But um, how are the flows going to change? I think there will be more flow of the U.S. production system to everywhere else, but primarily within the middle class, which to some degree it already was, which we're going to go through in a minute, why that was. But I think there's going to be a new transnational and what I'm calling transverse flow, a slight increase perhaps in production at the national level, but on the other hand, if they begin to kill off the third station in a number of countries, maybe not. Maybe the national production will actually fail That's, or begin to be more concentrated, say in the way that newspapers are now more concentrated in a number of markets. And the regional production flow might get a slight increase as well. So it competes in some ways. What are the things that compete with a logic of being drawn to your own or to similar cultures, to cultural proximity? And I want to go introduce this and go, then go deeper. Part of it, in various places in the world, but since I'm talking primarily about data from Latin America, I want to basically talk about Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico. All of those countries have had really significant social mobility based on economic growth in the last 10 to 15 years. And it's, it's vulnerable. Both the World Bank and other, and other sources say that it's a very vulnerable and very fragile new middle class. But it's a new middle class that's gained more money, gained more education, as we'll see, and is interested to some degree in the U.S. stuff. We'll, be, we'll go through that in detail. And certainly interested in having access to newer technologies, first cable TV and now, now the Internet. So here's something, again, I'm not sure how easily visible this is. Hopefully, this is kind of an average across in, the in 2014, which is the latest data I was able to get. They don't like to give you recent data. So most countries preferred national production. So this is average across eight Latin American countries based on major metro, it's not national audiences, but major metropolitan residents, which in some ways favors a globalized taste. But 59% on average favor national production, but 52% like American, 31% like regional, and 30% like European. And so it's interesting, this, when I first saw these data, I was a little shocked at how high the preference for American stuff had gone. And so in the book that I'm doing, I'm kind of making myself go backwards and, and kind of challenge my own previous work to say, well, look, it, this can't have come out of nowhere. Where was, how had this desire and liking for American TV built up over the years? And in many ways, people like me who were looking to see limits to that, what had we missed? And uh, a colleague who studies TV in Italy named Mili Buonanno had challenged me on that certain for several years ago. He said, look, Joe, I think cultural proximity is going to apply very well to national production based on what she saw in Europe. But I'm not sure we're going to see much regional because what Europeans like second best is American. And I think that may be a pattern we now see in Latin America and we'll probably see in much of the world. So this data, by the way, come from Kantar Media, the former owners of Ibopi and some of the other national services. And it is, I want, whenever I use this data, I want you to remember this is me major metropolitan areas. It's not national, which will actually tend to favor better educated, more cosmopolitan kinds of viewers. So one, I'm just, I, was, I, I like this just to dramatize what's been happening in Latin America. Here are a bunch of newly lower middle class kids going into a traditional middle class mall in a provincial town in Brazil. And this caused a big ruckus. The traditional middle class did not want to see these kids coming into their mall. You know, as the traditional middle class, they thought that was something they, that they had certain boundaries that they could defend as the traditional middle class, both in physical space and to some degree in cultural space. But a lot of purchasing power, some degree of change in education, um, and to some degree, an image of themselves as newly empowered. We, we now have a right to have the internet. We need, have a right to get, have cable. We have a right to put our kids in better schools. And 
all of that has, has kind of come into the, the spheres of culture and media consumption. So one result of that is a lot of those people turned to cable. I mean, in a place like Brazil, where in 2000, only 5% of Brazilians had cable, which was kind of stunning whenever I mentioned that to anybody. The rest of the world, by and large, was up in the 50s, 60s, 70s uh, by then. But Brazilians basically liked their own culture. They didn't see any need to pay $50 a month to watch American stuff. And so they, uh, only the elite really had cable. So now it's interesting how that's changed and how many more people are now seeking an internet connection. So in some ways I think the inter anything internet based goes beyond what cable had been able to do because that was very specific and it was very heavily, heavily loaded with foreign product. And in fact, you can make a pretty good argument. In fact, I'm trying to scope out the details of this for finishing the book. And I think I've almost nailed this down, but not quite enough to put it on a slide, that basically cable took off in Latin America when Mexico and Brazil started producing a lot of their own channels. And other countries did as well. So once TV Global had 10 or 12 of its own channels, then people came into cable. So cultural proximity is still waning, weigh, weighing in. And a lot of, I've seen data on Brazilians' use of internet, and an awful lot of their use is bounded by the Portuguese language. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays. But still, it's interesting if you look at a division of people's preferences between TV from the national TV. So the national TV bar here is red. And just look at the uniformity of that. People still like national TV a lot. On the other hand, what's happened as you go up through the years, the preference for US has grown. And the preference for regional and European goes up and down depending on, on the country we're talking about. And so I think one of the paradigms that's still highly useful, and this, for those of you who might be interested in cultural sociology, this ties into a really nicely hot debate in cultural sociology right now about is Bourdieu and his prediction of elite status leading to a distinct elite sense of consumption still the operative phenomenon, or is there more a new thing of a kind of cosmopolitan consumer who likes everything as a cultural omnivore? So that's an interesting debate right now. And I think probably an article that's going to come out of all this at some point is going to look at that very directly. Because I think in many ways we can see a classic Bordeauxian logic. People move up in wealth, move up in education, move up in cultural sophistication, ability to travel, learn languages, all of those things that go with both economic and cultural capital. I think that has a great deal to do with who ultimately wanted to watch cable TV and now who wants to watch Netflix. So if you can see there's a slide there that shows that between 20, 2004 and 2014, the demand for US material has gone up a lot in the better educated, a little bit in the medium educated, and not particularly among the lower educated. And so this, I think, in many ways is a middle class and upper middle class phenomenon, both 10 years ago, the, the surge of cable, and now the surge of internet use and, and Netflix in particular. Same with linguistic capital. So one of the things that bears in on this, I mean, we, we have a very bad habit collectively of talking about the digital world as though it were something that everybody has access to. Lots of people don't have access. You know, in Latin America, access to broadband per household goes from about 8% up to about 22% in Chile the place with the most access. That's not much. And those, in many ways, are the people who are probably going to most loyally watch Netflix, the people who actually have broadband at home. Because watching it on even, broad, even on mobile broadband is much, much, much harder. Plus, I think, so we've got a, a real question of infrastructure. Plus, even if you're a rich person in the middle of the Amazon, you may or may not get the bandwidth to, to, to watch Netflix. Um, so it's interesting, that plus cultural capital. The other thing which tends to come up as an argument is the, the factor that youth tend to be more interested in this. And if you've been following these issues in general, you'll know that this sort of popped up with MTV, <laughs> that MTV was going to globalize the youth of the world. That was a pretty big, pretty serious argument. What MTV did about two years after that argument was made was begin to localize. So MTV was the first channel that met the European content requirements because it wasn't hard to come up with European music video. That was pretty easy. Um, in Brazil, for some reason, MTV kept on playing heavy metal and rap. And 
because they had decided that they were most interested in the upper middle class and elite as, mar as a market. Their advertisers are more interested in that. So they didn't see a need to nationalize because in their perception, the upper middle and elite liked the American stuff. So there's a question of somehow a relative globalization and a question of, of, again, of taste and distinction. There's a question of whether this argument that's been made a lot, I think maybe now been critiqued to death, that millennials are somehow born digital. Well, not if you don't have digital at home. And so and there are huge limits to that in the global south, and Latin America is a good example. It is interesting that if you look at, say, very specifically Netflix use by generation, if here's the average Netflix use across Latin American metropolitan areas, it's much higher for kids under, for, for youth under 25, and it's relatively higher among, well, by the time you're into 35 to 40 year olds, it's, it's about average, but youth do seem to be more interested. On the other hand, it's primarily youth who were better off in the top 10 in, income bracket. And frankly, if you look at everybody in the top 10 income bracket, they're interested in Netflix. And so there's an interesting trade-off in youth, which tends to favor internet use and internet TV use, but also social class, which tends to favor it. And so that is, is where there's an interesting intersection. And so that's all still very much a kind of social class, Bordeauxian, those with better education tend to have different taste logic. So here's a different logic, which is the logic about people who not only probably have that status, which would lead them to, to like the, the stuff with snob appeal, to like the European and American material. The cosmopolitanism argument is a little bit different, and it's, it's more about attitudes within social class. So if I ask people if they're interested in things like international travel, international news, et cetera, and put together a little index of those things that inter indicate a certain degree of internationalism or cosmopolitanism, you know, here are sort of some of the factors that go into that, you know, including the empirical definition from this survey I was able to get access to. Um, it's interesting that it's to some degree a question of class, but it's to some degree a question of attitude, which probably also bears into cultural capital and other things, exposure via language and travel. And so here's the really interesting part. So if you remember those graphs that showed how social class really distinguished people in their taste for American and European programming, the cosmopolitans, so if, if this is US, this is national, et cetera, et cetera, they like everything. So this really does reinforce this one side of this current argument in cultural sociology that cosmopolitans are in fact cultural omnivores and they're different. And I think, here's where I wanna pull the argument together a bit, I think this is Netflix's audience. You know, elite enough to have a certain degree of access, but also cosmopolitan enough to be not only interested in the US stuff, but the Spanish, German, Korean, and a lot of other stuff as well. So here's Netflix's internal logic, the way they tell it. Let's, let's pull it back to Netflix very specifically for a minute. And so they, in fact, the number's gone up. This is a slightly old quote, but it keeps going up. So, you know, you're probably one of 1,300 distinct taste communities. I mean, just, you know, you probably can even remember this as kind of a personal experiment. Go down the rows of what Netflix is suggesting to you. And so I like dark Nordic stuff. I like stuff in Spanish. I like silly comedies in, Ameri in English, you know. It's, it's kind of got me, if I look at all eight or 10 rows, decently well pegged. They know a lot about me. They've been observing my behavior for years and matching up my behavior in terms of my preference for genre, but also other kinds of preferences that they're observing until where they, as Jose described yesterday, they have a lot of data about you on both kind of an individually and a modestly collectivized. Oh, you like Nordic dark stuff. Let's put you together with the other people who like Nordic dark stuff and then see this other person who likes Nordic dark stuff, what else do they like? So like this, for instance, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily intellectually connect stranger thing, things in Pokemon, but in fact, empirically they're connected and they're kind of going after this in a very empirical way. They're not really guided by language or culture. It's very inductive, very empirical. What do people like you also like? And so 
how Netflix bring, brings you your happy binging place. And, you know, again, thinking of, of the logic that Josie described, it's, it's, it works pretty well as a... There we go. So, you know, if just going mildly into the technology of it at a light level. We can talk about this more if you're interested. Kind of a huge, like all of the platforms, an accumulation of in, an individual preference data. But here is where it gets a little bit different from typical other platforms. Well, Amazon does this, honestly, uh, and does it quite well. But categorization of films and a lot of other things into very micro genres. And then the al algorithm matching of your profile to similar users and then the creation of these taste communities that link up both all your individual algorithmic data as well as the fairly detailed genre profiles that they're accumulating. So, where does this take us in terms of, of tendencies? Um, just a minute, okay, right. So I think Netflix, and I've definitely seen this both in, by the numbers and ethnographically in Brazil, confers a lot of symbolic capital on people who are striving to be middle class. I think that's a very powerful thing. I think, I think that's gonna pull a lot of people toward Netflix and uh, reward people to, who are already there. But perhaps even more important, I think, in the long run, because I think we've seen this all the way back just to TV flows in the 70s, the impact of cable and satellite TV when it came in, one of the things I've been worrying about for a long time is what happens to the elites? What, you know, it used to be just the top 10%, now maybe it's the top 30, 40% in the global south. Um, what happens to them when they are culturally pulled away from the rest of their national community? Which I think is kind of reverse regulation in a way that's very challenging. Um, we had a bit of a debate about that in the last session on, on cult cultural regulation in Europe, actually. And it's interesting to think about how people are being pulled out of a nationalized context, a national identity context, and into this individualized but also small group focused global pattern. And kind of global Netflix publics, if you will, very micro publics. So if you've, if you've been thinking about the whole discussion on, in some ways it takes the leotard op observation that one practical definition of postmodernity is the fact that nobody consumes the same media anymore. And so we are all now living in a microsphere, increasingly microsphere of media consumption. Here we've just kicked that into a much, much, much higher, faster gear. And so I think Netflix's approach to this, which is wildly successful uh, for them, has some pretty serious national and global uh, implications. I mean, on one way, it's, let's see, come on. So the social, let me at least kind of look at social implications first. So a lot of this is driven by social mobility that now gives access to these things. And it's very hard to critique that. We want people to achieve greater education and, and by virtue of that greater education be more interested in the rest of the world, acquiring the cultural capital to do so. And to some degree, that if that produces more cosmopolitan views, viewers, I've been to a couple of the cosmopolitanism panels here, and I think a lot of people are expressing ambivalence about cosmopolitanism in, a, in, in many ways, but it, to most of us, it's always been a goal, okay? Obviously, Donald Trump hates cosmopolitanism, and that just increases the ways in which I don't like my own president. But, but there is actually a reaction out there in the world to the notion of cosmopolitan people. You know, if you're, if you're a cultural nationalist, this is not what you like. And these are fighting words, at least in the United States, cosmopolitanism versus cultural nationalism. And so it's interesting to think about, I would think, personally, all things considered, that the cultivation of, of a more cosmopolitan set of viewers is all things considered not a bad thing. But if it lifts those people out of the national context and draws them towards something else, it's an interesting thing to think about. And that the fact that it's particularly accentuated among younger people, but I think in many ways it represents a social stratification that we do have to worry about. And that if we think about it, with the theme of this conference, which is the cultural regulation of flows, I think there's still a lot of regulation of national affinity through, an, through ideas like cultural proximity or cultural discount. 
but to some degree, global flows are gonna be strongly reinforced by net Netflix. And it might be interesting to talk about, does that mean a new wave of media imperialism or is it somehow something different? But it certainly means a new wave of transnational flow, which I personally find kind of interesting. I enjoy explaining to people while my favorite show is El, Minister El Ministerio del Tiempo from Spain. You know, I've always liked time travel stories, particularly time patrol travel stories, where a dedicated band of people are making sure that time doesn't get screwed up by the bad guys. So that's the Ministry of Time. You know, classic genre, at least if you're into science fiction. And, which is already sort of a micro genre, a micro, micro genre within a micro genre, but doing very well. Perhaps because in some ways that's Netflix's business model. And to some degree, you know, just it's another very hard hitting example of algorithmic governance of what Josie was talking about yesterday. And how does that play out? Again, maybe positively in terms of cosmopolitanism, negatively in terms of fragmentation and fragmentation away from national identity. Um, but certainly as a way of making, it's certainly a striking phenomenon in terms of a whole new logic, and maybe transverse isn't the right word, of cultural flow. All right, let me thank you and stop there. Thank you very much, Joe. And, and we have time for questions and comments. Yes, um, can you have the microphone, please? Yeah, and I can't see you. The light is blinding me. So, you know, if I, if I stare at you like the a little mole, that's why. The microphone meets... Here, no, further up. Two further up. No? Okay. Well, different order, Oops. but <laughs> I, I keep you in mind. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Won't forget you. Okay, thank you. Um, Hi, I'm Anubha and I'm from Monash University. Uh, as someone who binge watches on Netflix, your talk was extremely uh, insightful for me. Uh, my question to you is that, do you think in future the platform Netflix can become this place for producers in terms of local content that Netflix is producing now to bypass state interventions and censorship or even social and moral censorship? The reason I'm saying this is because in India, they have started local content. And one of, to give an example, one of them was directed by a big Indian film director. But instead of releasing it in theaters, it was released directly on Netflix platform. And the subject that it dealt with, I think if it had been released in a cinema theater, it would have caused public outrage. But instead, they released it on Netflix. And of course, it does uh, target cultural omnivores like me, but do you think in future Netflix might become a platform like that? Well, it's interesting, because that has several implications. One's being fought out in France, which doesn't want major films to be uh, released first on Netflix. It really, among all the countries in the world, is probably putting the heaviest emphasis on maintaining cinema-going experience like there was a huge battle over the Khan Festival. Does something have to be in a theater for six months or whatever the current time period is to be considered for Khan? And that was a, quite a high level visible fight between Netflix and, and, the, and the festival. So I do think, you know, that's, that's and just in terms of, in a very na narrow technical sense, the whole industry system of release windows, you know, that's gonna mess, this is gonna mess with that quite badly. In fact, it's to the point where major film directors who want to work with Netflix are trying to, trying to negotiate deals. Look, you can have it, but you need to put it in film theaters too. So there is this interesting hybridization kind of going on with, with cinema culture and, and, and the traditions of cinema where people want to see it go into movie theaters. At least in the US, it's very hard for film to be considered for major awards if it's not in theaters for a certain amount of time. So that's a very tense negotiation right now both in general and also literally between specific directors and Netflix. But I think the attraction to Netflix, which gives a lot of directors money to do pro essentially whatever project they want. I mean, they're throwing, the, the conservative figure is $8 billion in the next year. It may in fact be up closer to 12, according to some industry sources that are weighing in. And so that's a huge amount of money, probably 800 plus major projects. 
And so in many ways, it provides an incredible opportunity. I mean, the, the, the student filmmakers who made a pilot called 3% attract, pulled, convinced the TV Globo star to go into it because they had a good script and suddenly got picked up by Netflix and had world success. I mean, that's very hard to not be drawn into. And so the other thing that the, I've watched a couple of episodes of the, it's the, it's the police, uh, the, ball, the Indian police show that's out. I, what? Sacred Games. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, uh, that didn't seem, there's also kind of like we've been seeing with format TV, sometimes you, the, the flow comes along with a kind of an almost imposition of genre. Here's what does well, why don't you do one of these? And so cop shows do really well in the Netflix were. So I would love to know more about the background of that show, if the, if the director simply wanted to do a cop show or if somehow that seemed more probable to get funding within, say, the Netflix universe. Because I worried a bit about the controlling guiding mechanism of their genre preferences and their algorithmic data that indicate you know, what's gonna do best. Because there'll have to be negotiate, there almost inevitably will be negotiation between you know, people who want to do projects with Netflix and what Netflix, just like TV and film distributors all along, will, will say, here's what does best. Why don't you do one of these? Thank you. The gentleman in the back here, he, what's, please. I see you. Because Netflix, just thinking on, continuing on the thought while he gets to the, Netflix seems to be very open to a lot of ideas being pitched to them, but I can't believe that there won't be a classic broadcast style, certain degree of determinism, simply saying, hey, here's the successful models, you know, try to do one of the successful models. Although, actually, they seem to be more than broadcasting, open to kind of off the wall things. Like my crazy ex-girlfriend, imagine that on national TV. You know, that would never get scheduled um, any place, it just muddles all the genres way too much. Okay, back there. Uh, Dan Jezuska from Trinity University. First of all, thank you for your presentation, very informative. I have a very technical question, and this deals with the retention rate of subscri subscribers. And maybe you can detail a little bit of the profile of unsubscribers. And mm. in relation to this one, uh, maybe you have some trends on TV consumptions in the last uh, uh, few decades and how this relates <laughs> with, uh, with uh, YouTube, basically with platform distributed content. All right, let me refer you to the book, it'll be out in a year, but no, that's the flippant answer. Yeah, okay, because at least for Latin America, what I'm trying to do is take TV through the national phase and the national genre phase through what changed with cable and now into what's changing with Netflix. And there are significant changes. I mean, simply the change from dominant American flow to national TV and national genres in the 60s and 70s was huge. And it happened first in several major Latin American countries and then more elsewhere. So that was a trend that's still playing away. So I think what my initial answer was that in many ways all of these things are cooperative. It's not like they're, it's not like certain kinds of TV are simply going to die. I mean, one good model from the American experience at least is what tends to happen is new media layer up on top of old media and the old media continuing on but in a less prominent space. When we don't have 70% of our country listening to prime time radio anymore. But in my father's era, they did. And so these things tend to layer up rather than, than die off. So that's, now in terms of specific I mean, there's a, a phenomenon from cable that talk, they talk about as churn. People simply try things, discover it's not worth, in the case of cable, 60 or $70 a month, and desist. I mean, in some ways, people are projecting that the churn, in that sense, is going to be lower with Netflix, because 8 to $12 is not so hard to sustain. So I sus and they don't seem to be having a huge amount of churn. People tend to subscribe, eventually cut their cable subscription, and stick with Netflix, at least in the US. I don't have quite that, I'm trying to find equally nitty gritty data about Latin America, but the, the, the actual cutting off Netflix is surprisingly small. I think one thing that will happen, and this is 
the next year rather than the past year, as there's other really powerful players like Disney come out with, say, a, a sports package for streaming and a children's TV package for streaming of stuff that used to be on Netflix, at least the children's stuff, will people drop Netflix because what they really want is a kid's channel and they only want to spend 10 bucks. So that could happen, but it's not happening yet, actually. Um, I forget the second half of your question. What? Oh yeah, well actually, that, that is a bit frightening. All of this is cumulative. You know, new media layer on top of old media, and basically instead of reducing completely the time with old media, they simply spend more time. Now, at some point, well, that's, a, that's a gross generalization, but it's actually true at least for the US and for a lot of countries. We simply are spending more and more, I think we're over 12 hours headed toward 14. If you count social media, which you look at every 20 minutes for a minute, or you know, however, or however you do it. Um, the incursion of media broadly defined into our work and leisure just kind of keeps on going. And so it's not, we don't see that much dropping of old media entirely. It just tend, the, the space of media tends to have kept growing quite, I mean, we've gone from something like 10 hours of media 10 years ago to like almost 14 year, hours of media in the US now. So that's a, a pretty rapid increase, particularly add on the individualization of the way it approaches you, the mobility, the convenience, you know, the people have done studies. It's very hard if, there's, if your smartphone's with any, within 10 feet to not look at it, even if you have to kind of go eight feet to get it. Um, is there's, you know, we're not even quite sure how the, the mobility and individualization play out in the long run, but they'll, they'll, they'll play out very strongly. So. Yeah, that's a good question, how much, right now we're not seeing a lot of substitution effect, but it may happen eventually. Okay, we have two people in the audience in the position of a microphone. We start with the one in the back, please. Hi, um, thank you very much. I found that fascinating. Um, I'm from University of Warwick uh, in the UK, and we- Can you hold your hand up? I can't see you. Over here, oh, right in the are. back. Okay, you good. probably still can't see me. I can barely see you. <laughs> no, I can see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we had a group of MA students who were commissioned by a company called All Three Media to look at media flows between national territories. Ah. And they were looking, for example, at a sort of triangle between Turkey, uh, Mexico, and Korea. And they ah. were finding there was sort of interesting yep. correspondence in preferences there. Yeah, that's a very so, interesting triangle. So I guess my question really is, obviously, if you're all three media, they don't have the same data access that Netflix would. So maybe they're not, is it a case that they are being left behind and don't have access to this idea of the global taste public that you outlined? Or, are, or, or do you see that coexisting? So you have Netflix doing its thing and you have other broadcasters that might be looking at these transverse flows between countries at the same time, or is it, do you see them coexisting or one starting to knock the other out, I guess is my question. No, I can't imagine, in fact, if I could make a single macro point, Netflix is not gonna knock out national TV. It may narrow it down somewhat. There may not be three national networks in Brazil. There may only be two. But um, I don't see the very, very strong connection people have with national drama, national news, national sports, et cetera, going away. And I think some systems are stronger than others. I mean, somewhat to my surprise, Mexico is more persistently national in my data here than Brazil is, which totally surprises me. I would not quite have guessed that. And it's st statistically significant, whatever that means. Um, but the numbers are so big that everything's significant. So, um, you know, and I think it's interesting. If you take those very three producers, they're all champion producers and now high level exports, okay, champion, very American language, sorry, very successful producers um, of melodrama. And I think one of the, the lessons I've taken from the Latin American, Turkish, and Korean experiences, watching them and trying to figure out is that melodrama is this kind of ur genre that everybody's playing with in a lot of different ways. But Korean wave, both in music and melodrama, is horrendously success successful. One of my Korean students is looking at the Korean wave fandom in Latin America, which is remarkably big. Although that doesn't mean they're not watching national telenovelas. So what I find is a coexistence. So 
even the richest businessmen in Brazil will probably watch the most top-rated telenovela at least a few times so they knows what everybody's talking about. Because people will be talking about it. Um, I remember when I first got to Brazil in 1976 learning Portuguese, the very first day the teacher gave me my dissertation project. She said, okay, now, you know, if you want to get a sports, line up with the team and get a sports jersey and people will talk to you about that. Uh, but you, what you really need to do is watch at least two soap operas a night because that's what everybody's talking about. And I thought, ooh, this is not what Herb Schiller led me to expect. And um, yeah, it turned out to be a really good dissertation topic. So I think, and as it turns out, Turkey, Mexico, and Korea are right on the top of the global south, if that's one way you want to think about it, ability to produce intriguing melodrama fill the national space to a very large degree, and then export it very successfully. I mean, to that I would add Brazil, Lebanon, you know, uh, Syria, a few other places, quite a few other places, but it's not surprising that that's what your students found, that those are all very powerful producers, and in fact, if I was making up a new BRICS index, I would certainly include Turkey and, uh, and Korea. So, yeah, that's, 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 and, and it's interesting, they're not only filling the national space, but they're exporting, all three of those. I mean, Latin America prides itself on doing high-level melodrama. When Dallas showed up, they went, meh, meh, a bad American copy of a telenovela. You know, we, we know what this is. But they're actually watching Turkish and Korean stuff to some significant degree. Not huge, it's not dominating entire channels, but there's significant audience and significant fandom for it. So it's very interesting that those three came up, actually, both in terms of creating a national space that isn't going away any, any, anytime soon. I mean, it's quite possible for the national space to dissipate. Both Peru and Venezuela used to be major producers in Latin America. They're not anymore. Peru, largely because of economics. Venezuela, because of sort of political suicide and cultural economic implosion, I would say. But, I mean, if nothing else, Chavez abruptly canceled one of the two major producers, so that doesn't help. Um, whatever you think of Chavez politically, it wasn't a big help to the Venezuelan <laughs> television system. So um, it's interesting. I mean, you can reduce a national system in various ways, particularly politically and also if there's economic crises going on. But mostly I expect to see national systems being pretty resilient if they've been well-led, if they have money, and if they've developed genres that they're good at producing, which much of the world has. So, whoops, sorry about that. I fall down over things. Um, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a really interesting case in point, actually. So I don't expect to see Mexicans not watch telenovelas. They might watch some of, of Netflix's telenovelas in addition. I mean, the one called Ingobernable about high-level political corruption is doing pretty well. Ungovernable would be the, the English. Um, sorry, guess who? Kate Gildel Castillo. Um, so I think Netflix is going to try to compete in the national space, but I, I wouldn't even vaguely expect it to reduce the national broadcast space too significantly. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the, the really informative presentation. Um, my question is, uh, with, with regards to the algorithms that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that are the differ between different nations, uh, different between between states, uh, as in how uh, each na each country has its own kind of uh, taste uh, pattern that, that that's based on based on Netflix. Whether that can lead to some sort of uh, echo chamber of different tastes across different countries, and uh, whether that can be a limitation in the long run, because different viewers have their own bubble of, of taste. Sure. No, I think that's a very interesting question. Okay, and it actually lets me summarize a couple of things. So one is that the, the, the global out, US outflow will, will probably continue, and Netflix is gonna push it even harder. The other is that the national will continue to do well. And I think Netflix's algorithm will pick that up. So to the degree that it makes economic sense to them, they'll produce national material in Mexico and India and lots of other places. And I think when they pick up that places have particularly good transnational appeal, like they just committed to a big production center in Spain, because several Spanish series from television are doing very well on Netflix. 
In fact, if you look into, if you think of Netflix as kind of an on-live archive and go diving into its recesses, aside from Brazil, because TV Global wants to be its own Netflix and do its own streaming, which a lot of national TV intends to do. A lot of other countries have given some of their best tele telenovelas to, uh, te to Netflix, and you can th romp through probably, you know, 15 of the best telenovelas of all time in Netflix. In fact, I've been doing that. And, you know, for me, that's the great thing Netflix provides me is this cutting across, you know, or not even cutting across, letting me explore a region and language, et cetera, that I already like. And so I think there'll be that. They're, they're going to try to get both by acquiring existing stuff and by producing new stuff. If you're a Spanish speaker who you know, loves melodrama, yeah, they will feed that to you. So that'll be part of their equation. But I think they're not gonna give up on, so if I look, again, if I look at my very own you know, horizontal bars, two of them are now all in Spanish, because they've realized I like stuff in Spanish. And so both, there's a couple of, here's all the telenovelas, and here's another bar that's more eclectic. And then Spanish pops up by genre in other things. And so they've definitely f factored that into my personal algorithm. But I don't, I think they're going to continue to try to feed people a lot of other stuff. So it's not like they're going to say, oh, you're from Mexico, this is all you want. They're going to try to say, oh, you want this, but then you want all these other things as well. So I think that'll be essentially the nature of Netflix. It's going to try to figure out all the appeals that work for you with the algorithm just chunking away, saying, okay, who is this guy? Who is he like? What should we offer him? Um, and that gets continuously refined. So they will, before very long, you know, a couple of months after you subscribe, they'll, they'll, they'll have a pretty good profile of you, which continues to get refined. You know, it's kind of how algorithmic culture is working now. And I remember f seven or eight years ago finding how spooky it was that Amazon could so precisely predict my taste in books, et cetera. And so, um, you know, the algorithm's been with us for a while. It continues to get refined. And I think the algorithm is going to be quite multiple. There'll be a lot of the American stuff. There'll be a lot of what it figures you like from your own country and region. And there'll be all the transverse, transnational stuff that they think that you might be interested in. So we need to close it there. Um, thank you to the audience for all the questions, um, and especially thank you for Joe, oh, to Joe pleasure. for coming here and sharing with us your insights and reflections. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all. <laughs>